right. Um, assignment one questions or anything else? Oh, I guess I should uh, record. I almost forgot. Wait, did I? Oh, I am recording. I'm doing it subconsciously now. Cool. Uh, any questions? Homework questions? Anything today? Before we start talking about Smurfs? Smurfs, Smurfs? Anybody has any questions? Yeah. Yes. The deadline's been extended to Wednesday. Got an extra two days. Get it in. Yeah, see, I think, I don't know, people want a deadline, but like deadline extensions suck. You have to like continually work on it. It's the same thing with papers. When you're submitting to like a conference and they extend the deadline for a week, you're like, oh, I still have to like work on this thing for another week. Uh, any other? <laughs> Any other questions on the assignment? I'm happy to answer them now. Yeah. There's no test cases for uh, for the extra credit. Yeah, I'll try to do one today. But it should be fairly simple, right? So I make a request, uh, say that I accept GZIP for coding, and I make sure that you say that you're sending me back GZIP, and then I make sure that it's the exact same thing, you know, with GZIP, with not GZIP, right? So it shouldn't be any, I mean, it shouldn't be, it's not going to be anything trickier except for the fact that, like, it better be GZIP encoding that I get back. Yeah. Generally, so like it's kind of about any software, right? So specifically, this is a server, right? So if to do the test cases, right, we start the server, we run <coughs> test cases, and then we stop it. So if your server crashes during the test cases, right, then it's going to get an error like, hey, I couldn't connect to the server because it crashed, right? So this is part of building robust a robust server that works. Um, to me, that would probably be what I would look at. Would be like, okay, what are some like, is there a possible way I could crash the server, right? Or crashing is one thing, hanging would be another, right? If it's not accepting any new connections because it's busy, um, you know, maybe it went into an infinite while loop or something, right? I mean, those are the kind of things that uh, I would be looking for. Uh, you know, other questions are making sure that the output is like exactly as as we, we say it is, right? That you're sending the right headers, you're sending the right, um, you're sending the exact amount of content length that you specify in your header, that your headers are properly terminated. Um, I've seen a lot of like not correct line endings that still work correctly in browsers, right? The correct line ending is a CRLF, which is a slash R slash N. Um, Is required. It specifically says in the spec an um, HTTP request is this, 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 followed by CRLF, right? Where CRLF is a slash R slash N. Um, is it that? I don't know. There's a lot of mistakes that could be made. Um, these are generally some of the. Returning a proper HTTP 1.1 reply, which conforms to the spec, right? So this is about kind of read the spec and see like is what I'm actually returning. No, I'm serious. Or read the spec. I, I'm not saying that's what the problem is, right? It's too. It's too. I can't debug everybody's code. But when I see snippets of code and I see that there's that stuff in there, right? It means that you didn't. You gotta read the spec to understand exactly what you should be spent sending. Uh, when you fix those kind of things, like it's like little errors that magically go away, right? There's somebody who was not uh, even terminating headers. I think there's two headers that were concatenated together, and like that was clearly the problem, right? Um, the problem is how it manifests itself. I, it's it varies completely, right? Maybe some test cases will pass while others will fail. Uh, some things are just checking that something's listening on there. Um, you know, it's hard to. Hard to say 100%. The other things are, uh, you know, 
URL decoding, right? Are you doing it properly based on what we said in the spec? Uh, or like on our assignment description, right? So making sure those test cases pass. Are you accurately emulating, like if your language doesn't support system or whatever, are you accurately emulating it? Um, hey, guys, in the corner. You guys. Thanks. So yeah, if you want to talk about the project, you can talk about it. Um, happy to do so. So obviously direct questions or anything. I mean, I'll answer some. Uh, so yeah, I mean, hopefully that helps. Like it's not, you know, it's not supposed to be intentionally incredibly tricky, right? But if you're adding additional output, right? I mean, this is how we do test cases, right? We run it, uh, we compare the output of what your program sends with whatever, I mean, not just the output, right? But what curl says the output is or what a browser says the output is. We compare that with what we expect. If it's not there because there's extra HTML stuff or whatever, because that's not what we said to do in the spec, or because you're including standard out and there shouldn't be standard out, or because you're including standard error and there shouldn't be standard error in there, right? These are all things where you're not lining up exactly with what the spec, with what the assignment says, then it's going to be a you know, problem. Any other questions? We can talk about it. Yeah. Uh, do you need to redirect both standard out and standard error to one place, or is it is it like a Boolean thing, one or the other? There you go. Uh, like I have situations wherein there are uh, there's something in standard error out as well as in standard error. So do I need to like put them together and then put it out, or is it standard error only? No, only standard out. Only. only standard out. Only standard out, just like the assignment description says. You take the program, you put it in system, whatever the standard out is, you output that. Like standard out is not a, not a nebulous, it's like a well-defined thing, right? Like standard out, standard error. Um, so yeah, so you should toss away. You don't ever care about what's in standard error. You only want the standard out of the command. Yeah. So uh, sending a command that doesn't Whatever the standard error of trying to run system of that command outputs. All right, so it just does not exist. No, I think it does nothing. It's an empty string. I think that's printed out to standard error. Yes, so you should output nothing. The standard output of whatever you try to run that command does. That's it. So it's, like it's, it's not, no, I'm not, I don't know. It's complicated, right? But it should be complicated in reading the spec and understanding the spec, right? Not, these kind of things should be fairly simple. Yeah. So if, if the user sends a command that runs forever, then it's kind of up to you, right? I would just let it run forever, right? The user's an idiot. They shouldn't have done that. Uh, but, you know. Uh, I don't even know. I don't know if I want to continue. Uh, so, if you guys want to have discussions, you can always leave, right? Thanks. Uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to answer these questions so it'll be helpful, right? So, yeah, if you do that, right, the user does that, you can absolutely let it run forever. But if I make another request to your server, it better respond and not hang, right? That's, I think, the key. Um, so if that ever were to happen, you have to make sure that your server still responds. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the authorized case file, yes. can there be, like ideally, can there be a case where in the comment section it's not of the type you have <coughs> added your first name? Like, no. Ideally, so there's only it one. It can't be, right? There's only, yeah, there's only the two cases. So the only thing we're special casing is the comment section of authorized key. If it's, if it's one thing, just one word, you should return that. If it's user at host, you should return whatever that host thing no, is. If it's you, multiple stuff, you just ignore it. If it's one word, Yes. That doesn't mean that it's your host name, right? Correct. But I, we said that we're, you can special case that. So it's likely that that's a host name. We have to return that? Yeah. That's what special case it means. We're going to do that. We're going to do that thing. But just for that, right? You don't have to worry about comp. You shouldn't be parsing any other comment. It's just that file format. Any other questions? Uh, so we left off with a Smurf attack, right? So the Smurf attack, so what, um, what level of the networking stack 
is the smurf attack targeting? Is it targeting HTTP? Is it targeting TCP? Is it targeting Ethernet? Message, right? We're using the ICMP ping, the echo command, uh, not the command, but the uh, ICMP protocol to echo request and response. Uh, the attacker is using that, right? And what they're going to do is they use the fact that we can spoof IP packets, right? We can spoof the source of an IP packet. So we say, hey, this is a request from this machine that I want to take off, 128.111.4110, right? This is who it came from. Uh, I'm going to make an echo request to, uh, in this case, we're sending it to 192.168.1.255, right? And as we talked about, that's the broadcast address of the 192.168.1 network, which means that every host is supposed to reply to that address. So they all get that and they say, oh, this host wants to see if I'm up. Of course, yeah, I'll send, I'll send packets back. These are all my return packets, right, back to that host.10. And then I also do the same thing. So I uh, do another packet to 192.168.2.255, right? And so then all of them respond back to this ping. Uh, finally, uh, the different network, was it? Uh, 1.10. I can't even read that. Uh, 110.10.20.255, right? This other sub network. And so then they all reply back, right? So the effect is by sending three packets, Right? I've been able to get all these hosts to generate traffic towards this dot .10 machine. Right? And so this is actually, um, uh, I guess nowadays we talk about denial of service, we're concerned with really distributed, with like botnets, and you control thousands of machines and can generate a bunch of traffic, right? Uh, but the idea is here with this smurf attack, you can actually do this by just controlling basically one machine and knowing some subnet where you can do this. And the subnets themselves would generate leverage all these other hosts' ability to respond to this ICMP message to take this machine offline. Uh, and so this goes into actually one of the things that is really important. So why don't I just send these three packets to the dot .10 machine itself to take it offline? Like I'm trying to do it now of service. Why don't I just send them there? Yeah, so kind of the idea to think about is, yeah, I could send three packets to dot 10, right? Is that going to crash the machine? No. no is that going to saturate the bandwidth of the link between the machine? Probably not, right? Just three packets. But, so the idea here is leverage, right? So denial of service attacks are all about the attacker trying to use some leverage. So the idea is by sending three packets, now I could potentially have 254 hosts reply. Right? So I have an increase of one packet to 200 and, uh, what did I say, 254 possible, right? If every host is on that subnet, not likely, but uh, in the worst case, that's what I could do, right? So now I have a, a lot of leverage so I can generate a bunch of traffic to dot .10, right? Because that's kind of one of the things to think about with denial of service. It's like, okay, if I could generate enough traffic to do a denial of service to dot .10, right? Then I'll probably denial of service myself if I'm saturating the ethernet links or something, right? That traffic still has to get there somehow. Um, so these are kind of important things that we'll see in denial of service attacks that A, it's about leverage. So it's about using and finding some way to, or what they call amplification, right? So what's the amplification of me sending one packet? How many does the uh, uh, victim receive? Um, so if you remember, I can't remember when it was. Was that a year and a half ago where they had the NTP, the network uh, time protocol daemon, had a really bad amplification attack, so people were using that to take off, uh, to take down a bunch of servers. But it's the same principle, right? Different, tech, um, different technical implementation, but the same principle of amplification. So there's a bunch of ICMP messages. The specific one we're going to look at is the destination unreachable. This is the next one we're going to look at. Uh, the idea is the gateway can can tell the host that's sent there, like, hey, I don't know how to get, I don't know how to get to this destination, 
Um, it could be that the network is unreachable. It could be that that host is unreachable. It could be that it can't send on that protocol for whatever reason. Uh, it can't send to that port. So it could be a message saying that, like, hey, there's nothing listening on this port. Um, it could be that we requested that our packet not be fragmented, but we got a reply saying that, like, hey, we had to fragment your packet, right? So, uh, so these are all, right, so to kind of refresh ourselves, at the ICMP level, right, these are all helpful, useful debugging information, right? So you want to know if you tried to send a packet and um, you said, hey, don't fragment this packet, right? If they have to fragment it and they just drop it and it disappears, you'll never know if it got there or didn't get there or why it didn't get there, right? So this kind of helps try to answer that why question. And so this, there's another type of attack here um, where we can try to, uh, once again, kind of denial of service, try to cut a, a node out from a, of the network. Um, so basically, the idea is we are sending, let's see, man, okay, I gotta look at this screen. This is too small. I gotta fix this. Um, we are sending traffic, right, to 123, right, and we're saying that host, ah, yes, 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 host 56 is, uh, wow, uh, host 56 is unreachable. really understand what's going on here. Hmm. <laughs> We're forging it. Is the attacker sending it to the broadcast? No, the packet is being sent specifically to, so here we're sending it to dot 10, which is this machine from 123 which is that machine. Oh, 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 okay, okay, okay. So, right, right, we're trying to, okay, got it. Ooh. I still understand where the leverage comes from here. All right, uh, I tell you what, I'm gonna have to look this up because I don't, I don't understand What's going on here? <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I was thinking that maybe we're trying to take it out by telling other hosts that we can't reach that host and so they'll try not to contact it. Uh, yeah, it doesn't make sense. It should, that should be how it works. Um, so maybe it does work like that and I just have a, a bad idea of how it does work. All right. Yeah, the cloud part is just a router, so we're just showing that these are two different subnets. Um, okay, uh, we're gonna have to come back to that, sorry about that. Um, okay, so we'll go to the last, I think it's the last, uh, yeah, okay, cool. So we're gonna go to the last ICMP message. Uh, this one is really important. So what was the, uh, I think we mentioned it a little bit. What is the time exceeded? TTL, so what was the TTL? <coughs> time to live, yeah, which is, yeah, always very exciting. Um, Right, so the idea is when the TTL becomes zero, right, or if uh, we couldn't reassemble a fragmented datagram packet, uh, we get a time exceeded message back, right? So that's the switch's job or the host's job to tell us that, hey, we couldn't, like, this packet timed out. Um, so what is this? I think most of us or most of the people who've done network programming are pretty familiar with um, uh, what, what's the main way this is used in like a network diagnostic tool? Uh, so that the packet doesn't uh, stay in the network forever. Yes, that's why we do this, but we could just drop, so if we were using TTL, right, we could just drop the packet, right? We don't have to tell anybody, and the network I think will still be secure, or still be, uh, we won't have packets floating around forever, right? But what, like, This is kind of like a nice to have, right? So IP doesn't give any guarantees on delivery, right? So this 
it's definitely not something we need. Um, it's something that's very helpful and handy, and it's actually um, used in a tool that probably a lot of you have used before to try to debug network connections, uh, Traceroute. <laughs> Right, so this is actually exactly how Traceroute works, which is really cool. So it, um, what it does is it sends a packet out on the network with a TTL of one, right, and then it sees who responds back with that ICMP message uh, timeout received, right, and then it sends a new packet of TTL two, right, and then gets a response back. Um, so that this way, if you're getting ICMP me uh, timeout messages from each of these hops in between these switches, you can actually, from one host side, map out the entire number of hops and where your packets are being, and how, uh, where and how your packets are being routed through the network. Uh, so it's actually a really handy, uh, cool tool to use. Uh, definitely not in any way malicious, so you don't have to worry about, about that. Um, yeah, so the idea is you send a series of, I believe they're probably pinging messages or something, but it doesn't really matter. You send out IP datagrams, and you start at one, and each packet you give a unique ID, and you increase the TTL field by one. Um, so the idea is you do this, collect all of the time exceeded messages, and then now you have the IP addresses of where those ICMP time exceeded messages came from, and because you have the ID of the original IP packet you tried to send, you can map that to the TTL number. So you can see exactly how many hops. Um, so this is actually incredibly useful for, uh, from a security perspective, right? So why would this be useful? You can manipulate the path. You can manipulate the path. Uh, no, exactly where the packet is going. Yeah, so you can, uh, maybe you can manipulate the packet, right? So yeah, so but you'll never know until you know how it's getting there, right? So you may not know if it's a good path, or um, maybe you can find out information about those switches somehow, about the path. Um, yeah, basically, um, it also goes back to basic kind of reconnaissance and information gathering, right? So an attacker is trying to find out about the network, right? And so if they're able to trace how packets are flowing through the network, they can get information about how the <coughs> Hosts are switched together, what hosts are in different subnets, right, which can try to help them infiltrate the network. Something else I was going to say, but completely uh, lost it. Um, oh, yeah, so there's another actual, um, so it's also really handy to, uh, for you, the user, when you're doing this. Um, to try to determine, actually it's kind of fun to look at, so you can try to do, uh, what's the trace route from me to Google, yeah. right? Like how many hops does it take? Um, or me to, if you have like, I don't know, a video game server or whatever you're trying to get to, you can actually use this to determine uh, how many hops there are, you can try to determine slow connections. Um, uh, so we can look at like a quick kind of trace route thing if you do this, so it'll tell you uh, specifically, okay, we're trying to get to this machine here, 206, 132, 150, 233. Uh, we, we'll do, oh, that's right, okay, cool. Um, so the other, so the other interesting thing about the TTL, um, oftentimes, does anybody remember when, uh, I think the, it was the iPhones, uh, AT&T didn't allow you to tether your phone, like your internet, your computer to your phone and they would be blocking and uh, blocking people from doing that if they detected it, right? If you didn't pay for whatever their tethering thing was. Um, so they actually used the TTL and some other fields to detect that. That was one way they tried to do that, is if your computer is using your phone as a router, this is not a phone, it's in my bag, but uh, if your computer is using your phone as a router, right, then whatever packets you normally would send, their TTL is gonna be decreased by one when it gets to Verizon. Right, based on what it normally is. So then you can actually tell that that packet was probably from the phone on the other side. Uh, so then the people who made the routing software would then, on jailbroken phones, would then make it so that they would change back the TTL and not decrease it, right? So it's kind of arms race. And then I think they used like HTTP headers to try to detect, right? If you're having HTTP, like the user agent that says it's like a not a mobile browser coming from a phone. Anyways, a whole big deal, but kind of interesting TTL stuff you can do it. Um, so we can look at this, this trace route, so we can say, okay, this machine's the gateway, 
Uh, then after that, it went to this other machine. So how is it getting these names? Host names? They are host names, but how does it get it? Because it only knows the IP, right? What we give it is we tell it either this host name, right? So we can use DNS to translate that to this IP address. What about these host names in the middle? What information is it getting back when it receives the timeout exceeded packet? That particular machine's host name. Not host name, right? But IP, it's an IP packet, right? It, it knows who sent that IP packet. Right? And then it does actually a reverse DNS lookup to then try and map uh, this name to this host name. And if it can't do it, it probably will not show you. Or you can use, I think, the dash n flag again to, make, to tell it not to do that. Um, so uh, we can see our packets go out. And then at each point, it has the, um, these values are the time to live values of the hop. So it is, TraceRoute is measuring the time we sent the packet versus when we got that reply. Um, and so these you know, should be increasing, but there's actually no guarantee that they will because of congestion and all the crazy networking stuff that can happen. Um, so you can see here, oh, I should do this for here, but um, it's actually kind of crazy You can it, looking at where the traffic goes. Um, when I did this in Santa Barbara, not in the network, like at my home, it would go like, the traffic would go like, sometimes up to San Francisco, sometimes down to LA, sometimes like from there it goes all over the place. Um, sometimes some intermediate nodes, if they don't want to be discovered, like you get an asterisk. How yeah. That's true. So, even now, if you have to this Google is. Right, so this is probably my wireless. Right, so what happened here? What, this, uh, what does this asterisk mean? How does it know it failed, though? It was kind of trying to take a route and then it couldn't. Like, it was trying to make a route, but I can ping. Right, if I ping this IP address, 216.58.216 again, 216.14. Mm, actually don't, okay. <laughs> this is the ASU what network that I said, yeah. Um, go to your homework submission server. Hopefully there's nothing sensitive on there. Ah, there we go, see. Ah, it was the dash N, it was, it's trying to reverse it. Um, so I can even ping. Let's do it from here. Right, so I can see that I can get packets to and from that, that IP address. I can do trace route. What? Wait, you can't have any extra utilities on this. Uh, this is, <laughs> <laughs> this actually isn't, this is the submission server, and then there's, uh, Anyways, it's complicated, but yeah, there's, it goes into a queue, and there's workers that pull from the queue to execute all your submissions, but even then, it's done in like a CA through jail, so any packages get installed don't affect the outside, so. Oh, there we go, cool. Yeah, so we can kind of see the difference here, right? So any of these stars, so what does that mean, right? So we said that, we saw that I can get packets to this IP address, right? What was that? Uh, they won't respond back. What do you mean respond back? I'm not sending them a message though. Okay. Masking. What was it? Masking. Masking? Just think about what happens, right? So I'm sending, I take a packet, right? I set the TTL to one. I send it on the first hop, right? So this is this first hop here uh, is my gateway, right? <coughs> right? So. Then, so you gotta think about it then from the switch's perspective, right? So the switch gets this packet, it decrements the TTL, it sees that it's zero, now it has to decide what to do, right? So it can send an ICMP timeout exceeded message and then we'll see it here, right? Like this machine clearly is doing that. But the switch can also decide to just drop the packet on the floor and not do anything and not respond with the timeout exceeded, right? 
So then how does traceroute detect that? Yeah. In a specific time, right? Because that's actually all it can do. It actually, it can't tell, uh, did I not receive a timeout in 30 seconds because the network's congested? Maybe I never got back the reply, right? Maybe there was congestion in the network and my packet got dropped on the way back, uh, which is actually why I believe it makes three by default uh, packets so that you can tell if there's any congestion in the network, you can tell. Um, so yeah, you can see that like, that went out on, I don't know, quest.net and then to down to LAX. So we can see that like uh, this IP address that Google gives us is in LA. So it may be doing some um, tricks of when we do a DNS request, it's trying to give us a local, um, a local server. So it tries to give us a server in LA to go to. Um, and we can see here that like the route these packets took is very different. And we're not even getting any response back on the wireless, which is kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, it's 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 uh, pretty cool. Oh, there is uh, somebody has a really cool trace route that's like a story. All the host names. Oh, all right, I'll, I'll look that up and find out. It's really cool. There are several utility <coughs> website, websites that offer the trace route utility. Mm. Okay, yeah, yeah, and actually like router, route, I think your router will do that. A lot of the web interfaces, all that kind of stuff. Um, yep, very handy feature, handy tool to use. Uh, actually, that's right, the other thing I want to mention about this, so uh, there's actually a group of researchers who proposed a new denial of service attack uh, using Traceroute. Uh, well, not using Traceroute, but using Traceroute to plan the attack in some sense. Right. So one way we saw with the Smurf attack, right, is we can just send you a bunch of traffic, right? That's how I can knock you offline. I can take out a bunch of traffic, right? But I have to send this directly to this host, right? So I have to send this traffic to your host. Either the host itself is going to be overwhelmed with processing all this information, or some of the switches is going to the switches are going to be overwhelmed, or the the ethernet's gonna get saturated. I can do that, or, so in this subnet, right, what if I cut off this blue link here? Then can any traffic get to the subnet? So this traffic, all this traffic to get to this subnet is going through some switch somewhere, right? So what if I target that switch? And if I target that switch, it's going to knock off the whole subnet. Uh, so basically what these uh, researchers found out, I can't remember where they're from, but their idea was they could use Traceroute to map all the different connections in the internet and try to identify a switch such that it was upstream from my target, right? So traffic to my target has to go through this switch, but I can send traffic to another host and it will go through that switch too. So then I can take your machine off the network by sending traffic that's not even directed towards you. It's directed to other people, but because of how it travels through the network, I know it's going through that specific node. So it's kind of an interesting way of kind of like indirect firing of packets. You're trying to hit one of the other switches and they use Traceroute to try to determine that. Uh, so I thought that was a cool uh, approach to actually leverage this for a malicious purpose. Um, of course, one of the problems there, as we saw, right, is oftentimes networks will not tell you. You can't trace route every network. Um, plus, there is actually um, some people at the talk who are saying that at big ISPs, oftentimes they won't even necessarily, um, what are they saying? Sometimes they, when a packet comes in, they'll encapsulate it in something else and then route it through their own network. So it actually comes out as the same TTL on both sides. Uh, so you'll never actually know any of the hops within their network. Cool. Any questions on Traceroute? It's, it's fun, you should play with it. It's not malicious at all, so don't worry about that. Cool, all right, so now moving up from IP, right? So what's at the layer above IP? Yeah, the transport layer. So what are the two main transport layer protocols? TCP. Yes, beautiful music. 
Yes, TCP and UDP, right? Uh, so UDP is the first one we're going to talk about. Um, at a high level, what's the purpose of UDP? When do I want to use UDP? What was it? Connection Connectionless, what does that mean? If you want to. Wait, it's like. It doesn't have like a fixed route. Yeah, okay, so connectionless, so I don't have to establish a, to send a UDP packet or connect this to you, right? I don't have to establish an entire connection, yeah. Uh, why real-time communication? If in a video, if in a video, if a packet drops, it doesn't change the video. Uh, or right. So we said it's connectionless. If it is lost tolerant, then you can use UDP. And right. So what is it about UDP? What does that mean about UDP? So it doesn't uh, guarantee any service. Right. So we don't have to establish a connection first. We uh, have no guarantee that a packet's going to get there. What are some other things that kind of relate? That are all kind of. It doesn't hands. have a handshaking. Right, we got that with the connection. In order delivery. Yeah, no order, right? No order. So not only can packets get dropped, but they can come <laughs> to us in any order, mm -hmm. right? Um, there is no forward congestion in circulation. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's kind of a good one. Um, yeah, so uh, there's no explicit mechanisms to limit UDP traffic, right? So we can kind of send as much as we want. Um, so yeah, so basically it's connectionless, right? It's unreliable, which means the packets could drop, anything could happen. Um, best effort, which just also means unreliable, right? If somebody's gonna tell you they'll do their best effort, it means that, you know, it means whatever it means, I guess. Um, datagram, which means it's gonna send some data, right? So there's no kind of limitations on what it's gonna send. So the important thing, right, delivery, the fact that it's delivered or not, you will not know when you send out a UDP packet, right? That's the other thing. So not only can it be dropped, but you may never know if it was accepted or not. Um, the integrity of the packet is not guaranteed. Ah, leave that. I think there's a checksum, but yeah, no overall integrity. Um, the ordering, packets could be duplicated, right? UDP packets can be duplicated, we'll, we'll not know. Um, and bandwidth is not guaranteed, which goes kind of the, to the congestion control. Uh, but, so it's, uh, the, uh, I'd say the dominant is definitely TCP as far as like, I don't know, amount of traffic and all that stuff, but UDP is definitely used in a lot of key internet technologies and protocols, uh, and that's why it's incredibly important. Specifically, uh, DNS uses UDP, right, which is really important. Um, and also some peer-to-peer -peer networking type stuff, or some, Video conferencing is kind of the classic uh, UDP. Uh, the important thing here is, so up till now, how did we talk to a different machine? What do we need? IP. The what? IP. IP. Yeah, we need an IP address, right? Uh, so UDP and kind of the higher levels introduced this port abstraction, right? Which says that, well, uh, okay. The IP, if you think about everyone living in a building, right, the IP address is the building, but the port would be the apartment number, right? So it's like, what app, because now we're starting to get closer to the application. So I'm not just trying to get a piece of information from me to you. I'm trying to get it to a specific program running on your machine. Um, yeah, so there's a, it's, it's used. Um, so if we look at a UDP message, uh, we have the source port, so this is important, so this is us, so the, the port of the application or whoever that sent it. Uh, the destination port, where we want the destination port to go to. Uh, the length of the message, a checksum, and then the data. So wait, what about the IP address? How do we get this packet to them? inside the data. Yeah, uh, yeah, right? So it's, the packets are layered, right? So just as we saw, uh, an IP packet, right, is encapsulated within a what packet? 
on a wired network. It's an Ethernet packet, right? The link layer. So the same way UDP packet is inside an IP packet, right? So before the IP, the UDP header is going to be an IP header, right? And then within that, that's all encapsulated within the frame. So you have kind of uh, everybody's seen like those Russian nesting dolls, right? So you have the big Ethernet packet, you pull it apart, it's a little smaller doll, which is the IP address header, and then you pull that apart, and then you look inside there, and that's the UDP header and the UDP data. Even the header will be inside the data. Uh, no, I have the nesting backwards. So this, the UDP packet is inside the IP packet, right? So the IP adds its own headers on top of that. And then the Ethernet frame adds headers before that. So each layer, when it processes it, right, like the network card, basically, uh, essentially, investigates these headers and then returns as data to whoever wants it this IP packet. And then above that, this UDP packet is what the application would receive, more or less. They can also read those other packets if yeah. it's important to them. So what does this mean? So we looked at, so looking at this message, right, what did we learn about the source? What did we learn about the source and destination IP? In the security context. They're not explicitly checked. Yeah, they're not explicitly checked, right? We can just make an IP packet with whoever source or destination IP we want. Uh, what about these ports here on UDP? Application run on different ports. What about security? So who checks that we're, it actually came from our source port? If I were an attacker crafting a UDP message, what of this can I control? I can use any source port. Everything, yeah, everything, right? I can control everything. And in fact, I control everything on here, right? Which is what makes security so difficult, right? Is I as an attacker can control everything on here. So we saw that by manipulating the source IP address and the specifically uh, spoofing the source IP address or maybe changing the destination IP address. We can play games with that. Um, so we can do the same thing with uh, UDP, right? So we saw that we can spoof IP packets. Well, UDP packets are basically the same thing as IP packets, right? So if we have this trusted client and this server and we're in the middle, we can spoof a UDP request from the trusted client to the server. So what do we need to make sure we specified? The what? The port number. Yeah. So which port number? Yeah, both. Right. We have to make sure it's the trusted client port number and the server that we're trying to get to's port number. Uh, the IP, we'd have to make sure the IP addresses right. The from IP address is the trusted client. The to IP address is the server. So then, what happens when the server tries to respond here? What was it? The strip link. Go to the strip link. Right, yeah. So it's going to get that UDP request, right? And the only information you have to respond to a UDP request, right, is inside that packet. So what's the IP address of who sent it to you and what port were they? And that's how you send a connection back. So that reply is going to go back to the trusted client. So if we can. Get it to the point, oh, it's clearly not a variation. Oh, yeah, it is a very, okay. It's a very, yeah, it, UDP hijacking, similar to IP hijacking, a variation of the spoofing attack. The basic idea is the client is gonna request something from the server, like a DNS request, and say, hey, what's the IP address of google.com? Right, so if we get this request also, right, so when can we get the request? What was it? Yeah, sniffing the network if we're on the same subnet. Maybe we've done some ARP poisoning or ARP spoofing, right? Uh, maybe we can, if we can get that request. Now, if I reply back, right? As long as my reply gets there before the servers, now the client's gonna think that I responded as the server. So when the server gets these two packets, right? What's different from them? And these two packets, the spoofed UDP reply and the UDP reply. Source and 
The source? What are the source of both of these packets going to be? The server? Yeah, but we're spoofing it, right? So that's the important point. So we are we control the source port and the source IP address, right? So we can spoof the reply to make it seem like it came from the server. So we set the source port to be whatever the, we use the UDP request and we set whatever the destination port is, the destination port, uh, the source port. Let's see, am I, am I doing this right? Um, yeah, we set the destination here of the UDP reply to the, the the source of, yeah, we switch those around. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say because I'm getting confused talking about it. Um, the idea, the, yeah, the, the basic idea here is, right, in this UDP request, we have all the information we need to be able to generate a reply. Right? And because, and this goes back, because UDP is a connectionless protocol, right? Client and server aren't talking, really. It's just a, hey, send a packet and then send a reply. Right, when you get a packet, send a reply. So why would this be useful? see this spoof reply. But even then, how can you prove that it's not just a duplicated reply? So what does DNS do? Yeah, right, it's just like a simple, at a high level it's very simple, so it just takes in the names, right, human names, translates them to numbers, right, like IP addresses. Um, how it works is it works for UDP. So uh, <coughs> your, each of your machines knows of a DNS server, right? Either through DHCP or something, right? So when it gets a request for a name it's never seen before, it asks that DHCP server, hey, what's the IP address of google.com, right? And then it, it's exactly like this. It makes a UDP request to, I can't remember the port. Is it 53, 52? 53. 53. Yeah, so it makes an UDP request to port 53 and says, hey, what's the IP address of google.com? Right? And then it gets a response, a UDP response back that says, hey, uh, google.com is at, what is it, 216 something, 216, I don't remember, it's in a 2216 in it. Right? This is the IP address of Google. Right? So would that be really cool if we could pretend to be google.com to people? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Right? And it's as simple as this. Right, so think about a wireless network, right, with no security. We see all the UDP requests, right? We're on the same subnetwork as the client. We see all the UDP requests. At that point, it's very trivial to respond faster than the DNS server and say, yep, don't worry about it. Google.com is 192.168.1.1. It's definitely me. Send all your stuff to Google.com, right? And then they'll contact us, and we can pretend to be Google. So this is actually kind of a fundamental problem that um, a lot of the upper networking layers have to deal with, and that's why we have certificate pinning and all these other kind of things at the top layer, because <coughs> of this fundamental problem with UDP that it's so trivial and easy to hijack a UDP connection, and the fact that DNS relies on this unreliable connectionless protocol. Cool. So we'll stop here, we'll get into some port scanning, and then we'll Hopefully on Wednesday we'll knock out all the rest of the networking stuff and finish with TCP.